Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. And by Mysterious Tales of Loss and Woe and Other Jovial Stories, a new book by Truist Dunkworth. In a world of wonder, this is a book that encourages teens and preteens to think and be surprised. Look for it on amazon.com. Previously on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. In June of 1979, a stranger drove into the small town of Elberton, Georgia. He stopped at a local granite company and said he wanted to build a strange monument almost 20 feet high. Some call the guidestones America's Stonehenge, and many are deeply suspicious of the monument. Some link it to witchcraft, the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, the Illuminati, or the New World Order. The Georgia Guidestones are an interesting and enigmatic monument. However, their fundamental purpose is clear. They aren't the product of a sinister or occult group like the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians or the New World Order. They are designed to help mankind reboot civilization in the event of a nuclear war or other planetary disaster. But there's still lots of mystery we need to examine, including who Robert Christian was and what the inscriptions on them mean. You're listening to episode 142 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Georgia Guidestones and the Christian faith. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In June of 1979, a stranger drove into the small town of Elberton, Georgia. He called himself Robert Christian, but that wasn't his real name. For 40 years, people have wondered who Robert Christian was. They've also wondered about the meaning of the Georgia Guidestones and the Ten Principles inscribed on it. They've been called the Ten Commandments of the New Age, or even the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. What's the truth about this monument? Who was Robert Christian, and what do its ten guidelines really mean? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. All right, Jimmy, let's go right for the big question. Who was Robert Christian? Despite the fact that Wyatt Martin, the banker, has kept his promise not to reveal Christian's identity, This mystery appears to have been solved, but I have to say I am not comfortable with the way it was solved. Last episode, I mentioned that in 2015, the evangelical production house Adullam Films released a documentary about the Guidestones called Dark Clouds Over Elberton. They were the ones who cracked Christian's identity, but... And this is a big but. They did it in a way that I'm not at all comfortable with. I understand it on a human level because they were really curious, but they basically took advantage of Christian's banker friend, Wyatt Martin. How did they take advantage of him? At the time they interviewed him for their documentary, he was an old man who had recently suffered a severe stroke. Even though he firmly told them that he would not reveal Christian's identity, they were able to get enough clues from him that they figured it out. For example, they learned that he had an old computer case in his shed that contained papers about the Guidestones project, including letters from Robert Christian. Martin had saved these because he thought he might one day write a book about the experience, though, of course, that wouldn't mean disclosing Christian's identity. He wanted to keep the papers so that he could look up exact dates and things like that. What the filmmakers did was they started asking him about the case of papers and slowly worm more information out of him. First, it was hey, can we see the case? You, you don't have to open it. We'd just like to get some footage for our documentary. And he agreed to that. Then when he showed them the case, it was like, 
hey, can you open that case so we can see that there are, in fact, papers in it? That's all we want to do. And he agreed to open the case and let them see that it had papers. Then they started asking him about particular papers in the case, and he said that some of them were letters from Robert Christian. So they said, can we see what his handwriting looked like? Can, can you show us his Robert Christian signature? So Martin held up the envelope of a letter and let them see the handwritten address to his Martin's home at the time, and he also held up a typed letter from Christian and let them see the signature. And he read them part of the letter, which he said was from 1998, and in which Christian mentioned that he was then 78 years old, which would put his birthday in or near 1920. Now, it was Martin's choice to disclose this information, so I can't fully blame the filmmakers for that. Is there something you do fully blame them for? Yes, what they did with the camera while he was showing them the material from the case. Even though Martin tried to keep his thumb over the postmark of the letter so they couldn't see where it was mailed from, they caught the postmark on film anyway. They also zoomed in on other correspondence and were able to get the addresses off them, even though this was against Martin's wishes. So in my view, they took advantage of an old man who had just had a stroke and surreptitiously took information that he was trying to keep private. In the documentary, they even make a big production of dramatically zooming in on the clues and freeze-framing them with the sound of a camera clicking with dramatic music playing in the background. Let's listen to that moment where Martin asks them if they're finished and the cameraman says, let me do a slow zoom on the case's contents. And then you hear the camera click that they add to the freeze frame of a crucial address that they've spotted on one of the envelopes. It's finished. Yeah, I think that... Let me just do a, a slow zoom on... It's like the filmmakers were saying to the audience, Aha, gotcha! And for me, it's a very uncomfortable part of the film that has a really slimy, manipulative feel. This makes me really uncomfortable, and I thought about not covering this aspect of the mystery, but I ultimately decided to go ahead. What helped you make up your mind? Several factors. First, the information is out there on the Internet. If you research the Guidestones in any depth, you will come across the identity of Robert Christian. And once information is publicly known, it shifts the dynamic of a situation. It requires a special reason to pretend that we don't know something when it's right out there and a simple Google search will reveal it. Second, Christian is passed on, and so he can't be hurt by the information the way he could when he was alive. After all, he said he remained anonymous because he didn't want to get into debates and contentious situations, but he's beyond that now. Third, even before Christian died, he got to the point that he didn't mind his identity being publicly known. In fact, in 2003, he called Joe Finley, the Granite Works owner, and said he was ready to come forward. Here's Findlay's son, Joe Findlay Jr., talking about that phone call. About seven years ago, I believe it was now, Mr. Christian called Daddy one night at home. So, Mr. Findlay, this is R.C. Christian. I'm ready to reveal myself, tell you who I really am. Daddy said, I don't want to know. I've gone all this time, didn't know who you were. I don't want to know who you are. So daddy died not knowing. And I don't want to know. So before the end of his life, Christian got to a place where he didn't mind people knowing who he was, but he got the idea that people really weren't interested by that point. That peace he apparently achieved with his identity being known was a factor here. Fourth and finally, after the filmmakers discovered his identity, they tried to sensationalize it, and they tried to paint him in the worst possible light in ways that I don't think are entirely fair. So I think it's worth considering some facts they chose not to include in their documentary that could put things in at least a somewhat different light. What did they find out about Christian? 
Well, to review what we already knew, in 1979, Christian was an older man with white hair and male pattern baldness. He spoke with what the Georgia natives perceived as a Midwestern accent. We also have information about the times of his birth and death based on the information in the letter that Wyatt Martin read out loud to the filmmakers. We know that his birth year was in or near 1920. Based on the phone call to George Findlay, we know that he lived until at least 2003. But Martin said in 2010 that he had died several years before. So that would suggest his death was somewhere in the 2004 to 2006 range. We also know that he was concerned about ecology, conservation issues, and overpopulation. What did the filmmakers learn when they got their peek inside the case of papers? They could see the postmark on one of Christian's letters, and it had been mailed from Fort Dodge, Iowa. So they knew that he lived there in 1998 when the letter was written. They also got a picture of an envelope that had originally contained a Smithsonian magazine that had been forwarded to Christian. It was sent to Martin's home address in Georgia to be forwarded to Christian, and the envelope read, Robert Christian, care of Mr. Merriman, M-E-R-R-Y-M-A-N. So they knew someone named Merriman was involved. And they got a picture of an envelope, apparently from Christian, with the address 730 Raywood Drive, W-R-A-Y-W-O-O-D, 730 Raywood Drive in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Armed with that information, they did something that previous researchers apparently had not thought to do. And this action was legitimate because it didn't involve tricking or taking advantage of anybody. Robert Christian in 1986 had published that book, Common Sense Renewed. And when the book came out, it was released by a business called Graphic Publishing Company in Lake Mills, Iowa. This was an imprint of a company called Stoyles Graphic Service, So they called Stoyles and asked who published the book. And what were they told? That it was published by a man named Robert Merriman. So they had their first candidate for who might be Christian. But they quickly found out that Merriman couldn't be the guy because he died in 1992, over a decade before Christian did, and six years before the 1998 letter that Christian had sent to the banker Wyatt Martin. So that Smithsonian Magazine apparently had been sent to Mr. Martin to send to Mr. Merriman to send to Mr. Christian. They also found that Merriman was a publisher and that he was at least a co-owner of Stoyles Publishing. So it makes sense that he would publish Common Sense Renewed. It looks like he was the same kind of figure as the banker Wyatt Martin. Christian needed a banker who knew his identity to handle the money for him. That made Martin what's known in the espionage trade as a cutout, a trusted intermediary who knows the identity of the person they're representing, even if other people don't know it. But if he was going to publish a book, Christian would need another cutout in the publishing world. And it looks like that's who Robert Merriman was, his publishing cutout. As a publisher, Merriman would need to know the identity of the person he was doing business with, and the fact he could forward Smithsonian Magazine to Christian confirms that he would have known his identity. It's also significant that he was located in the same area of Iowa as Christian. It means he likely knew him better than Martin did down in Georgia, and it means he very likely could have been one of the anonymous backers that helped Christian with funding. What did the filmmakers do once they determined Robert Merriman couldn't be Robert Christian? They focused on the other information they got from their peek inside the case of papers. They had seen one of Christian's letters that had a postmark from Fort Dodge, Iowa, and they saw another envelope, apparently from Christian, that had a return address of 730 Raywood Drive in Fort Dodge. So they looked up that address. As they expected, it was not the address of Robert Merriman but it was the address in the correct time frame of a doctor, a physician, named Herbert Kirsten. So he was the second candidate for who might be Robert Christian. What did they do to see if he might have been the right guy? One of the things they did was go to his grave and look at his tombstone. 
It turns out that Kirsten was born in 1920, the same year as Christian. It turned out also that Kirsten died in 2005, in the middle of the time frame when we could guess he did. And it turned out that right on his tombstone, Kirsten had inscribed that he was both a physician and a conservationist. So he wanted to be remembered even in death for his support of conservationism, which obviously was a major concern of Christians. Also, as part of their research, they found articles talking about Kirsten's concern about overpopulation, another one of Christian's concerns. And when they looked at a picture of him, it turned out that Kirsten had white hair and male pattern baldness just like Christian. So they had multiple points of contact suggesting that Kirsten was Christian. And you may notice that the names Kirsten and Christian sound the same. That's because Kirsten is a Germanic family name that means Christian. So maybe Kirsten picked the name Robert Christian, not because he was personally a Christian or not simply because that, but also because his real name sounded like and meant Christian. After all, when people pick pseudonyms for themselves, they often pick ones close to their real name so that they have an easy time responding when someone refers to them by name. If he was used to being called Mr. Kirsten, it would be easy for him to respond when someone said Mr. Christian when he was down in Georgia. Also, his birth name, Herbert, sounds a lot like the assumed name, Robert. That's a matter of speculation, but the points of contact the filmmakers found between the two were enough that I think they're right. Herbert Kirsten was Robert Christian. What do we know about Herbert Kirsten? As we said, uh, he was a physician and a conservationist from Fort Dodge, Iowa. He was also an inventor and held patents, including for a combination form and facing device for concrete. Uh, That ties in with something Robert Christian had said, which was that he'd once worked with concrete. Kirsten also at one point got into architecture and designed a bandstand that was built in his local town, and that ties in with the fact that Robert Christian was interested in architecture, as illustrated by the Guidestones. You said that the filmmakers tried to paint him in the worst possible light. How did they do that? The guys from Adullam Films produce documentaries that are tied into end-time themes, and so they try to fit their subjects into a sinister overall narrative. Uh, For example, their webpage refers to a Jesuit plan in 1825 to seize control of the Bible. You know, those sinister conniving Jesuits are going to seize control of the Bible. Also, they say that the Anglican Oxford movement was really run by secret agents from Rome. And they talk about how Protestant Bibles have been corrupted by Rome and stuff like that. So they're not going to be very favorable towards Herbert Kirsten because, guess what? He was a Catholic. And in fact, by the way, that may be where R.C. Christian comes from. He could also have picked that those initials because it could be Roman Catholic Christian. But he wasn't always a great Catholic because he didn't accept the church's teaching on contraception. Here's an exchange where they ask a local historian in Iowa about this. One of the writings on the George the Guidestones has to do with population control and a concern for the world population. What do you know about Mr. Kirsten's opinions in that regard? Uh, well, they would be antithetical uh, to the Catholic religion. And he is supposedly a Catholic, and when he died, he left $400,000 to the uh, local diocese. In other words, uh, the church thought uh, birth control was a sin. Not so Dr. Kirsten. So Dr. Kirsten, even though he was a professing Catholic, his views were contrary to the official teachings of the Catholic Church. Oh, yes. But was was he then well known? for his views about population control? I think fairly well. So Kirsten was a Catholic and a rather serious one, given that he left $400,000 to the local diocese when he died. But he also apparently didn't accept all the church's teachings, and like a bunch of Catholics after the 1960s, he happened to dissent on the question of contraception. The filmmakers also found evidence in an article that quoted Kirsten about the subject where he expressed approval of contraception. 
Since the filmmakers are evangelicals, they may not have a problem with contraception themselves, so how do they paint Kirsten in a bad light? Well, they may not care about contraception, but they do care about the end times, and they look at everything through the lens of what might be leading up to the reign of the Antichrist. The documentary has this kind of end time conspiracy theme running through it, so they're looking at the Guidestones and Kirsten through that lens and asking the question, could this all be part of a conspiracy to promote a sinister anti-Christian New World Order? But the most explosive charge they make against Kirsten is the claim that he was a racist. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear, racism is evil. All human beings are God's children, and God doesn't care what your skin color is any more than he cares what your hair color is or your eye color is. Racism is wrong. At the same time, charges of racism get thrown around with great abandon today, and it's one of the quickest and most convenient ways to harm a person. But the charges aren't always true. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're exaggerated, and sometimes they're outright false. So we need to be careful and look at the actual evidence. What evidence do the filmmakers present that Kirsten was a racist? Two principal things. First, they talk to a local historian who says he was told, so he didn't hear this himself, says he was told that Kirsten made what somebody took to be racist remarks. And maybe he did. But that's secondhand evidence or hearsay. Secondly, they find a newspaper column in which Kirsten is quoted as saying that he liked certain ideas being proposed by a couple of politicians. And one of these politicians had a racist history. However, he doesn't say what the ideas were that he liked. It might have had nothing to do with race. And what the documentary makers don't tell you is that the politician in question became a born-again Christian and renounced racism. So was the politician sincere in that? I don't know. Politicians say a lot of things that are convenient for them, but that aren't necessarily true. I haven't studied the life history of the politician, and so I don't know if he was sincere in his conversion or not. But what I do know is that simply saying you like some things a former racist said doesn't mean you're a racist. I further know that Kirsten isn't around to defend himself or clarify anything. And I know that if Kirsten held racist views, they aren't found on the Guidestones or in his book, not from what I've been able to find. I've done electronic searches on the book, and there's just no discussion of these type of race issues. Also, the fact that Kirsten included languages like Swahili, Hindi, Arabic, and Chinese on the Guidestones would cut against the idea that he held racist views, since those languages are spoken in areas where people aren't of European ancestry. At a minimum, the use of those languages on the monument itself suggests he was more concerned about the survival of the human race in general, rather than what the race of those individual people happen to belong to. So it might be true that Kirsten held racist views, but the filmmakers have not shown that to be the case, and they withheld facts from their audience, like the conversion and repentance of the politician, that could hurt their case. I thus have to leave it up in the air whether and to what extent Kirsten was or was not a racist. And there's nothing about race in the Ten Principles on the Guidestones, which we'll talk about next. Before we do that, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Austin K., Timothy J., Jedediah Lee H., Arthur B., and Edward C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And now's a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at, say, $10 a month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all our shows, including this one, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. 
Visit sqpn.com slash give today. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. And by Mysterious Tales of Loss and Woe and Other Jovial Stories, a new book by Truist Dunkworth. In a world of wonder, this is a book that encourages teens and preteens to think and be surprised. Look for it on Amazon.com. So, Jimmy, what can we say about the Georgia Guidestones from the faith perspective? Here's where the filmmakers and a lot of people see a lot of problems. As Christian indicated in his book, Common Sense Renewed, some of his pieces of advice would be controversial, and some have tried to fit them into a sinister New World Order agenda. That's why some have called them the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. Before we look at the ten pieces of advice on the Guidestones, let's hear what Kirsten himself had to say about them. He writes, I place these ideas on the threshing floor of the public forum where that which is useless or in error, the straw, if you will, can be separated by the flails of critical discussion. I am hopeful that when the residual chaff has been winnowed away, there will remain a few kernels which can be added to the store of human wisdom in a manner that will contribute to the general welfare. I have no pretensions to authority. I am a plain citizen without scholarly stature or political experience. I present herein certain views dealing with a variety of subjects. Some of these thoughts, particularly those which relate to my private concepts of the cosmos and of our role within it, may offend certain of my readers because of seeming conflicts with their own cherished beliefs and traditions. It is not my intent to stir up controversy. Each of us is entitled to private views gained through personal experience. I do not challenge the opinion of anyone in these matters. I simply present my thoughts for those who seek to review a variety of opinions when dealing with controversial matters. Others may ignore them. The guides are not religious. They are not commandments. We have no authority to command. Affirmation of our thoughts can only occur as they are endorsed and supported by the reasoned judgment of this and future generations. We invite human beings of all persuasions to consider them with open minds, adapting them to the changing circumstances of unknown future centuries. So he's not sounding like a particularly sinister authoritarian here. He presents his ideas without any claim to authority. He says everyone has a right to his own views, and if you disagree with his, you can just ignore them. He expects his ideas to be challenged in critical discussion and some of them to be shown wrong or impractical, especially in light of the changing circumstances of unknown future centuries. But he hopes that some of them will be useful. And so this isn't a super sinister precursor of Antichrist mode of speech. So what does he say about religion? He says, My personal religious beliefs are based imperfectly on those of Christ as adapted to my understanding of reality. I can easily live in peace with others who hold quite different views. These essays are addressed to open-minded citizens of all national, political, and religious persuasions who are willing to review our problems in the light of collective reason. I recognize the differences which separate my understanding of reality from that of religionists who interpret the Bible and other ancient documents in a literal fashion. If we had lived identical lives and reviewed the same evidence together, we would probably agree on most things. Truth will prevail when we seek it honestly. We can discover agreement in many areas, even while we mutually respect our rights to disagree. So he says he's a Christian, but an imperfect one, and of course, they all are. He's also not someone who takes everything in the Bible literally, and not everything in the Bible is literal, though whether he's correctly identified which parts are literal and which aren't is another question. He wants to live in peace with non-Christians, and he respects everybody's right to disagree, but hopes that we can discover areas of agreement. What about his views on democracy and the American political system? He says, For more than 60 years, I have benefited from the American political system, which was built through the labors and sufferings of our forebears. Some of my ancestors participated in the major wars which forged and preserved our liberties. 
They were represented in the armies of George Washington and of both the North and the South in the period of our Civil War. I voice my views from a sense of obligation to them and to all who have helped to make our nation a stronghold for freedom and a home for democratic principles. So he comes across as a patriot who recognizes the benefits of the American political system and those who have helped make our nation a stronghold for freedom and a home for democratic principles. He doesn't sound like a person wanting to usher in a sinister totalitarian new world order. Concerning both religion and politics, he says, The Guidestones are not intended to have sectarian appeal. They are a reminder of the challenges that face present and future generations of humanity. They are intended to encourage efforts to meet those challenges rationally, without favoring particular religions or political systems. We believe our thoughts are rational proposals for dealing with the problems that confront us. They are intended to stimulate discussion and logical, compassionate action. Again, these are discussion points or suggestions, not ironclad rules. Are these simply Kirsten's suggestions, or were they the ideals of a broad, ongoing secret society? Oh, anything is possible, but in his book, Kirsten writes, I am the originator of the Georgia Guidestones and the sole author of its inscriptions. I have had the assistance of a number of other American citizens in bringing the monument into being. So Kirsten alone wrote them, though he had input from other members of the group that funded them. Also, they weren't an ongoing group, he says. When the central cluster of the Georgia Guidestones was completed, our small sponsoring group was disbanded, leaving the monument in the safekeeping of the people of Elbert County, Georgia. If the inscriptions are dimmed by wind and sun and time, we ask you to cut them deeper. If the stones should fall or be scattered by people of little understanding, we ask you to raise them up again. We invite all who share our goals to extend the monument with other stones to carry its thoughts in languages not already represented. So according to Kirsten, the original group disbanded when the Guidestones were unveiled in 1980, and they only hope that other people will maintain them in the future. Let's look at what people have called the Ten Commandments of Antichrist. How do you want to proceed with that? I'd like to start with number 10 and work our way up to number one. People tend to list things in order of importance. So by starting at the bottom, we can deal with the less concrete, less important items and finish with Kirsten's most concrete, most important items. The 10th or last piece of guidance on the stone was be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. What should we make of that? It's a largely poetic expression, as suggested by the repetition of leave room for nature, leave room for nature. The poetic nature of the expression is also suggested by the vague, be not a cancer on the earth. Neither of these statements are concrete suggestions. They're airy statements that express a general concern for mankind living in harmony with nature without contributing anything concrete in terms of how that's supposed to be cashed out. But it is consistent with the fact that Kirsten was an ecologist. The ninth piece of guidance was prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. What should we make of that? This is even more hippy-dippy than the previous guide. <laughs> Everybody on Earth prizes or should prize truth, beauty, and love. They also should seek harmony with the infinite, which for Kirsten would mean harmony with the Christian God, though he left the door open for people of other faiths. But really, this provided basically no concrete guidance to future generations concerning what they should do differently than the generations that preceded them. The eighth piece of guidance was balance personal rights with social duties. What should we make of that? This is one that almost everybody would agree to. Obviously, we all have personal rights and obviously we all have social duties. Merely stating that these need to be balanced does nothing to tell us anything concrete about how things should be governed. It's just a piece of general advice for people who want to see the Guidestones as advocating a totalitarian state where the individual has no value, it may be enlightening to consider the following passage from Kirsten's book. We believe each human being has a purpose and a significant place in the divine plan of the universe. So every individual matters and matters to God. 
Also, if people are thinking that he's advocating some kind of secular liberal society that has no place for conservative values, the following passage should be very enlightening. In America today, we are witnessing a number of social changes that are causes for concern. The first has to do with widespread instability of the family unit. The second relates to an increasing dependency of many citizens upon government agencies for their financial support through a philosophy of entitlement fostered by elected officials, which assumes that Americans with financial problems are automatically endowed with the right to preempt from taxpaying fellow citizens funds to support them in idleness and comfort. The third cause for grave concern relates to the widely apparent dependence of many potentially productive citizens upon drugs and alcohol as a means for narcotizing or avoiding the stresses of life's realities in our industrialized society. So three of the biggest and most pressing problems we face are the breakdown of the family, the growth of government, and the unrestrained use of drugs and alcohol. Here's some of what he has to say about easy divorce laws. A stable and secure family unit is a characteristic of the most enduringly successful nations. In recognition of this fact, most societies have established strong legal and social sanctions to promote family stability, protecting the role of parents and particularly that of the mother. Yet other than marriage, no other contractual arrangements are so flagrantly and quickly abandoned when one or both parties grow tired or disillusioned or merely bored with the obligations assumed under the marriage agreement. Today, nearly half of American marriages end in divorce, disrupting the lives of the partners and causing untold social and psychological consequences for the innocent children conceived in the emotional sunshine which has warmed the relationship in its early phases. Divorce shatters the home environment and disrupts the family relationship, a social arrangement that has proven most successful in nurturing children through their formative years, producing stable, well-adjusted adults. How much future damage will stem from society's tolerance of the present wholesale abandonment of marital and parental obligations by so many of our citizens? What will be the social and civic character of children whose fathers have abandoned their families, very often with inadequate financial support, nearly always depriving their children of the psychological reinforcement of a strong father figure of integrity? Marital stability is a legitimate concern of society as a whole. Our national character and strength are threatened when we permit without effective protest today's widespread abandonment of marital obligations. And here's what he says about the growth of government bureaucracies and how it interferes with individual liberty and self-reliance. American self-reliance is another virtue that needs renewal. Nearly half of our citizens receive government support. Distant officials take the earnings from some citizens and give them to others through a variety of entitlements and through direct and indirect subsidies. Such programs invariably stem from good intentions, but seldom are of lasting benefit and too often have unexpected consequences in hampering productive efforts by the public at large. While collective action is no doubt required for specific social problems, it is likely that greater overall advantage would accrue from tax incentive programs that stimulate private initiative in the generation of economic activities and in the creation of full employment for all citizens capable of productive labor. A properly tuned incentive economy will provide greater benefits for all and will bring the added advantage of maintaining our personal liberties. So he wants to get people off welfare by incentivizing job creation through lower taxes to stimulate private businesses. He's not exactly a flaming socialist. He sounds more like Ronald Reagan. And here's what he has to say about substance abuse. The present epidemic of drug and alcohol abuse raises many grave questions. More must be done to educate our people to the miserable effects of toxic substance abuse. We must reach young minds before they are lured into the fantasy world of chemical nirvana, from which many, once trapped, will never return. Let us provide better role models for impressionable young minds than we now permit in the form of entertainers and other influential public and private citizens who openly or covertly endorse the use of chemical escapes from unpleasant realities. 
So he's not into the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. From a 1960s hippie perspective, this guy is a total square. He's in favor of strong marriages, low taxes, and avoiding substance abuse. Can you tell this guy is a conservative Christian doctor from the Midwest? The seventh piece of guidance was avoid petty laws and useless officials. What should we make of that? It's particularly hard to disagree with this one. Petty laws are bad things. Useless officials are bad things. Since by definition, petty and useless are bad in government. Uh, This is kind of like saying avoid bad stuff. This is a guide that has a rather libertarian tenor advocating a smaller number of laws and a smaller number of government officials. That's not a domineering totalitarian New World Order sentiment. It's advocating limited government. And it sounds like Kirsten has had some encounters with laws that he regards as petty and officials he regards as useless. In his book, he says, Our government structures have developed lives of their own, growing beyond the effective control of the legislative bodies which spawned them. Monstrous bureaus in our national and state capitals have become almost independent of citizen influence, resisting all efforts to eliminate or control their activities. Employees of some government agencies are insulated from the people by barriers of regulations and layers of divided responsibility. They have feathered their nests with guaranteed pay raises, special financial benefits, and generous pension programs with automatic inflation index increases. They've excluded themselves from the social security burdens which they've inflicted on ordinary citizens and have assured themselves job security by a maze of civil service regulations which are impervious to outside challenge. Nearly one in six American workers today is employed by government. Unrestrained government growth has begotten unrestrained government spending. Enormous public debt threatens our economic survival. So rather than wanting a totalitarian state where the government runs everything, he wants less government spending and involvement in society. Thus far, Kirsten has come across as ordinary and Midwestern in the values he's advocating. But does he say anything you wouldn't expect? He makes a couple of suggestions for how to break the cycle of dysfunction in American politics that would definitely be controversial. First, he proposes that people should have at least a baseline level of knowledge before they can vote. He says, We should consider making the right to vote conditional. We might, for example, impose certain educational requirements. In a society which provides tax-paid educational opportunities for everyone, We should require proof of understanding of our government and its history and problems as a prerequisite for voting. It would undoubtedly improve the quality of government if voters were required to pass a simple test covering the structure of our government, our history, and our general economic system. Our citizens must now pass a comparable examination to qualify for driving on our streets and highways. And he's right that you've got to pass a test to show you know how driving works before you get to drive but you don't have to pass any kind of test to vote. One of the reasons this idea would be controversial today is that in the past, such tests were used before voting. Specifically, in some states between the 1890s and the 1960s, you had to pass a literacy test to vote, and this was used to keep African Americans from voting. The test was theoretically race neutral, but it affected African Americans disproportionately. Could this be an area where Kirsten was harboring a racist idea while cloaking it as race neutral? It's possible, though he presumably would deny that, because here's what he says about the difficulty level of his proposed political knowledge test. The level of difficulty of the voter qualifying examination should be high enough to exclude political illiterates, but not so high as to eliminate individuals of average understanding and education. If, at the same time, we provide all citizens with access to schooling, that will enable any mentally competent person to qualify. Our democracy will be strengthened. So he wants voting to be available to individuals of average understanding and education, and he sees it as important that all citizens have access to schooling that will enable any mentally competent person to qualify. At least based on what he says, he wants the schools to educate people so that voting will be available for any mentally competent person, irrespective of race, which he doesn't mention at all. 
What's the other proposal he makes that would be considered controversial? He writes, It would be reasonable to require evidence of economic productivity as a qualification for voting. Citizens who long remain on public relief rolls, performing no services to compensate for their financial support by the taxpayers, should not vote. Any resulting injustice would be outweighed by the long-term gains. The purse strings of charity should be controlled primarily by the giver, not by the recipient. In this land of free education and economic opportunity, it is shameful that some families remain on relief rolls generation after generation. Wise legislators, elected by responsible voters, would find ways to interrupt this endless chain. Productive labor of some kind must be made a basic requirement for full citizenship. Elimination of minimum wage laws combined with income supplements from tax funds and mandatory work requirements for able-bodied welfare recipients would be logical starting points for correcting the shortcomings of our present welfare arrangements. Here he combines two ideas. The first is that people should make an economic contribution to society to vote, and the second is how to reform welfare. Regarding the second, his desire to eliminate minimum wage laws reflects the economic liberalism that Kirsten's thought displays in general. Economic liberals, as opposed to political liberals, have long argued that the minimum wage actually kills jobs and discourages full employment. For example, uh, they'll argue that the fact that current efforts to raise the minimum wage will harm workers in the fast food industry because robots that make burgers and pizzas are about to become cheaper than human employees. In fact, robot chefs are already being tested by some fast food chains. If the employers are forced to pay humans more, they'll simply switch to robots in order to keep prices down for their customers. That would put people out of work and make it harder for people to get entry-level jobs, which they need to start with, and thus it would harm their long-term careers. Although we didn't abandon the minimum wage, the welfare reform that occurred in the Reagan and the Clinton eras did involve mandatory work requirements, which its supporters argued did effectively help people get off welfare rolls and back into productive employment. The more controversial proposal that Kirsten made here is the first one, showing proof of economic productivity to vote. Historically, in the United States, in some places, that took the form of paying a poll tax. In other words, to vote, you had to prove your economic viability by paying a certain amount of money. And once again, this disproportionately affected African Americans and kept many of them from voting. Could this be evidence of Kirsten harboring racist ideas? Again, it's possible. I suppose that he would defend himself by saying something like, I'm not asking people to pay poll taxes. I'm asking that they show evidence that they're making an economic contribution, and that could be accomplished any number of ways, such as getting voting certification when you file your tax returns or by showing a pay stub. I also can imagine him saying, you know, read what my proposals actually say. This isn't about race. And the proposals themselves, he would say, aren't unreasonable. You need information to use your vote responsibly, and it's not intrinsically wrong to show evidence that you have the knowledge needed to make an informed choice. Similarly, he might say, we need to avoid situations where we develop a permanent underclass that can't get out of poverty, and that will only fuel class warfare as demagogic politicians promise more and more entitlement benefits without the productivity needed to sustain those benefits, leading to an economic crisis that harms everybody. Kirsten could say it's true that similar measures were used unfairly in the past, but that's not what he's proposing. He could say, for example, in the past, you often didn't have to pass a literacy test or pay a poll tax if your grandfather was qualified to vote, leading to the origin of the phrase grandfather clause. Kirsten could say, I'm proposing that these measures be applied fairly to everyone, no matter who your grandfather was. Just because similar proposals have been abused in the past doesn't mean that they similarly have to be abused in the future. At least, 
I can imagine Kirsten saying those things, but I don't know if he actually would. I'm just speculating, and it could be true that he harbored racist ideas. However, he does make one comment that more directly addresses the issue. Reasonable standards for voting and for holding public office need not impair participation in our democratic process by any segment of our population. So based on what he says, he thinks that reasonable standards for voting need not harm participation by any segment of our population. Unless he's lying, he doesn't want to exclude any segment from representation. Also, he makes another suggestion which would really ruffle some feathers in Washington. Candidates for public office should be required to demonstrate a basic understanding of world and national history and some grasp of economic principles. In this country, members of the learned professions must demonstrate competence in their chosen fields before they can serve the public. Legislators enact laws which have profound impacts on every phase of our economy and our personal activities. They and those who administer their laws have much greater power over our lives than do any of the licensed professions, yet they have kept themselves excluded from legal provisions that would require them to demonstrate measurable qualifications for the jobs they seek on Election Day. Candidates should be required to pass an examination for the award of a Certificate of Qualification for Public Office. The needs of our people will be better served by officials who meet certain basic qualifications than by others who may or may not be intellectually qualified, but who rely primarily upon the arts of demagoguery and salesmanship to gain public office. So he doesn't want any more demagogic politicians who get elected by firing up popular passions without knowing anything about the subjects on which they'll be making laws and policies. His argument is if doctors and lawyers have to show that they know what they're doing before they get to treat patients and clients, politicians need to show the same before they get to start monkeying with the national life of America. While I think many people would find this idea intriguing, I think it would be hard to get politicians to vote it into law. <laughs> yeah. So the sixth piece of guidance was, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. What should we make of that? Kirsten writes, Using common sense as our guide, we must unite with the entire human family in establishing a limited world government capable of settling international disputes through a system of law. The word limited in that is stressed in the original. Kirsten is advocating only a limited world government consistent with his general limited government views. He's not advocating a totalitarian world government, which is what people are afraid of. So this is something like the United Nations and the world court that we now have. It might be somewhat stronger than the United Nations, but not something that would abolish national sovereignty. What he's principally concerned about is avoiding war. Beyond that, he seems to largely want each nation left alone. We have outlawed the use of murder and violence in resolving individual disputes, but have failed to develop procedures to peacefully settle conflicts between nations. Meanwhile, we have made the world an atomic tinderbox. We cannot permit the present condition to continue. Nowhere do we observe proper concern for devising political arrangements that will assure international peace and the free flow of commerce and knowledge while preserving for each nation reasonable autonomy within its borders. With such a system, we could eliminate war and provide every person an opportunity to seek a life of purpose and fulfillment. There are alternatives to Armageddon. So he's advocating a world court that could settle disputes between nations. He's not advocating a world state that takes away the autonomy of nations within their borders. The fifth piece of guidance was protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. What should we make of that? This is another one that most people would find hard to disagree with. Who wants to advocate the idea that we shouldn't protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts? So there's not a lot to say about this one. The fourth piece of guidance was rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Should we find that disturbing? In principle, everything in life should be ruled with tempered reason, because reason is a gift that God gave us to discern the truth. We shouldn't be doing anything contrary to reason. 
On its face, this should be another bland, positive aspiration. Certainly, passion should be governed by tempered reason, you know, lest international passions cause a nuclear war or something. But what about faith and tradition? By saying those need tempered reason, is he using code to say that we ought to disembowel faith and tradition and sweep them away in favor of a triumphant secularism? That's what some fear he meant here. But it's not what he says or what he means. Here's what he says in his book regarding tradition. Rapidly changing times test the social adaptability of our cultural heritage. Excessive rigidity or unwise flexibility can have equally disastrous consequences. We must accept change, but do so thoughtfully, with appropriate regard for the larger framework of life. We will be wise to maintain great respect for traditional values. Human nature has not changed in historical times. Traditional attitudes of society dealing with a family, sexual conduct, integrity in personal and business relationships, and with countless other ethical principles that have survived the tests of time, should not casually be discarded simply because technology has modified human living conditions in the modern world. Increasing knowledge has not changed our fundamental biological nature. So he advocates neither excessive rigidity nor unwise flexibility, but a reasoned approach to how and when cultural traditions need to change. And he urges great respect for traditional values because he points out human nature has not changed. We've already seen what he has to say on the subject of faith, and while he may not be an Orthodox Catholic on every point, he's certainly not in favor of abolishing religion in favor of secularism. He's also right that faith and reason need to work together. As John Paul II said in his encyclical Fides et Ratio, faith and reason are the two wings of the soul that let it rise to the truth. By contrast, faith divorced from reason, a blind fideism, will definitely cause you problems. The third piece of guidance was unite humanity with a living new language. What should we make of that? This is another one that sounded Orwellian to some, as if he wants to abolish all the existing languages and replace them with a global new speak. But that's not what he's talking about. He writes, A world language need not eliminate national languages. Every spoken language is useful, for it helps to segregate its unique segment of humanity from the general mass, permitting it to develop its potentials in its own environment, influenced by its own traditions. Variety is intrinsically good and must be encouraged. Literature and all the arts flourish under the sheltering protection of a language which has developed in a common culture. But national languages may also be divisive and can permit islands of misunderstanding to develop and grow into sources of major difficulty. So he doesn't want to eliminate local languages. Here's what he does want. Properly designed and stabilized, a common tongue for all nations may someday span chasms which would otherwise divide the human family. It will make possible the accurate transferal of thought down the long reaches of time. It need not be spoken by all. It will be most useful for those who bridge international barriers and for scholars in the remote future who interpret the past. It will help maintain unity in diversity. In essence, he's asking for a common global language that, even if it isn't known by everybody in every country, is used by professionals who conduct things like diplomacy and scholarship. In other words, a new lingua franca, an international professional language. We've had multiple languages like that in the past, including Aramaic, Greek, Latin, and French. And we have one now. It's called English, and it's used in diplomacy, science, transportation, and commerce. He's just advocating that the survivors of a nuclear war come up with one as well, and that would be a good idea for them. The second piece of guidance was guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. What should we make of that? Thus far, none of the ten guides on the stones themselves that we've looked at have been intrinsically contrary to Catholic or Christian teaching. Most of them are basically platitudes that nobody who understands them correctly would object to. A couple are more debatable as policy matters, but not contrary to Catholic teaching. I'm talking here specifically about the 10 guides that are written on the guide stones. Some of the ideas in the book are even more debatable, but 
that's beyond what's on the guide stones themselves. However, the last two guides, or I should say the first two guides, are much more charged and potentially subject to abuse. Consequently, they're the ones that get the most attention, which is why we've saved them for last. Guide number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity, sounds to a lot of people like a mandate for eugenics. The word eugenics comes from Greek roots that mean good birth, and the idea of eugenics, the basic idea, is to improve the human gene pool over time. Versions of this idea have been proposed ever since the time of Plato, who recommended the idea in his work The Republic. However, in the early 20th century, a major eugenics movement began in Europe and America, and it developed a really bad name for itself being supported by, among others, Nazi Germany. It was associated with eliminating people who were regarded as racially inferior, including Jews and people of African descent. Anytime anybody starts talking about improving the human stock, alarm bells naturally go off, and they should. What is Kirsten advocating with guide number two? He's included one thing in the guide that appears to distance it from Nazi-style eugenics. The Nazis thought that they were the master race, and their eugenics program was focused on improving racial fitness and fitness alone. They were not interested in racial diversity. And that was stupid, as we discussed in episode 31 on Hitler's religion, because you need a diverse gene pool in order to have a successful population long term. If you have an inbred population with limited genetic diversity, all kinds of problems crop up and one good virus can wipe out huge numbers of people. We need genetic diversity as a species in order to be successful in the long term. And Kirsten recognizes that in guide number two. That's why he's written in it to encourage guiding reproduction to improve both fitness and diversity. If he had just said fitness, you could think he's just a Nazi. But no, he's interested in promoting genetic diversity as well. It still sounds like there's a lot of potential dangers here. What do you think? I think the dangers center around two key questions. First, what does he mean by improving fitness? And second, what does he mean by guiding reproduction? These can either mean something acceptable or something nightmarishly horrible. Let's look at both of those. What would be acceptable and horrible versions of improving fitness? An acceptable version of improving fitness would be eliminating genetic diseases through acceptable means. For example, letting married couples know whether their children will have a significant risk of having a serious genetic defect so that they can make decisions about whether to have kids and then use moral means like natural family planning. In principle, that's a legitimate way of guiding reproductive decisions, but it can go wrong in a whole bunch of ways. Doctors might frighten parents away from having kids when the risk of a serious genetic defect is slight. Oh no, we've got a 1 in 10,000 chance, we better not have kids. Or they might frighten parents away from having kids when the genetic disorder is minor. Our child might be lactose intolerant, we better not have children. Or they might frighten parents away from having kids that don't meet some arbitrary standard. Our kids might not all have genius IQs. We better not have kids. Or they might encourage parents to use illicit means of controlling reproduction, like contraception or abortion. What about acceptable and unacceptable scenarios for guiding reproduction? An acceptable scenario would be giving parents information so that they can make informed decisions, but it's the parents making the decisions. It starts to become unacceptable when the parents are pressured into making decisions they otherwise would not make. And it's even worse if the government takes the decisions out of the parents' hands and tells them whether or not they can have kids. So on both of these points, there's lots of nightmare potential. What does Kirsten have in mind? Let's listen to what he has to say in his book. We are devoting more attention to the production of improved plants and animals than to the selective continuation of our own species. 
Worldwide, human conception is still governed principally by biologic and social forces with little conscious guidance. We establish social environments in which many talented and productive inv individuals are constrained to limit their reproduction, while at the same time, we provide subsidies that encourage childbearing by the indigent, the lazy, the irresponsible, and the inadequate. Desirable mental and physical qualities can be enhanced in future human populations by encouraging their reproduction and by discouraging the reproduction of their opposites. Talents which are considered to be marks of genius when they occur infrequently today can be made to occur more frequently in the world of tomorrow if we increase the contribution of gifted persons to the total gene pool through 10 or 20 generations. Over 3,000 human disorders have now been identified as genetically determined. We can reduce their frequency in the human population of tomorrow if we discourage childbearing by known carriers. In the remote future, no child should be born with congenital handicaps which could have been avoided by rational actions of his ancestors. Humanity has successfully applied practical genetic principles in developing domesticated plants and animals. It is now within our power to begin the domestication of our own species in a parallel fashion. Docility, loyalty, and other desired qualities have been selectively augmented by human intervention and control over the breeding patterns of man's best friend, the dog. We could one day achieve comparable but much more important modifications in our own nature if we were to begin a conscious and sustained effort to direct our own genetics. Let me just say, this absolutely gives me the willies. It sounds like an open door to a genetic nightmare. While he doesn't call for the state to make all the decisions on behalf of the parents, he's not just talking about eliminating genetic diseases. He's talking about treating human beings like dog breeds and breeding them the same way. That's absolutely unacceptable contrary to human dignity and contrary to Catholic teaching. We'll have a link to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's 2008 instruction, Dignitas Personae, so that you can read up on what's acceptable and unacceptable in this area. Also, because he was writing in the 1980s, he's missing a concept, which is a two-edged sword, genetic engineering. In the future, we will have gene therapies available that should be able to fix genetic defects so it wouldn't matter what recessive genes the parents are carrying. The other edge of the sword, though, is that it will be very tempting for future parents and governments to genetically engineer offspring to have the traits they want, whether it's heightened intelligence, heightened physical strength, heightened docility, or anything else. So, we may well get a genetic nightmare world, but through genetic engineering rather than selective reproduction. The first piece of guidance on the Guidestones was maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. What should we make of that? This has been the most controversial of all the guides. In 1980, when the Guidestones were unveiled, the world population was 4.5 billion. Today, in 2021, it's almost 8 billion. If we were to take the world's population level down to what Kirsten recommended, it would have meant a decrease of 4 billion people in, from the 1980 level and 7.5 billion from the present level. That sounds and the question immediately arises, how would you do that? People wouldn't do that voluntarily, which means the government would need to pressure them by laws, possibly with forced sterilizations, forced abortion, forced infanticide, or even the extermination of populations, all nightmare scenarios that gravely violate human rights. Is that what Kirsten is recommending? He's certainly not recommending mass extermination. In the first place, he's writing on the Guidestones for the survivors of a nuclear war, and he's envisioning a world population that's lower than the one they had in 1980. If the nuclear war was really bad, there might be less than half a billion people alive, and they might not need to reduce their population at all. In that case, he would simply be recommending that they not let it grow beyond that figure. However, he thinks that half a billion is the maximum number, at least approximately, 
the maximum number of people that the Earth can sustainably hold. So absent a nuclear war, he would recommend getting it down to that level, but slowly, without mass exterminations. He writes, A few generations of single-child families will make possible dramatic improvements of living standards in even the most impoverished countries. So this would be an orderly drawdown over generations, not a mass extermination. That still leaves the question of what methods are used to accomplish it. Right. Now, speaking hypothetically, the Earth is finite and can only hold some finite number of people. I don't think it's as few as half a billion or anywhere close to that, but we'll discuss that later. Still, the point remains that it has some maximum but finite holding capacity. If mankind were at or above that capacity, it would be legitimate for governments to encourage parents to voluntarily limit their childbearing through morally acceptable means like natural family planning. However, let's hear what Kirsten has to say. First, here's his overall argument. Nearly every nation is overpopulated in terms of a perpetual balance with nature. We are like a fleet of overcrowded lifeboats confronted with an approaching tempest. In the United States, we are seriously overtaxing our resources to maintain our current population in the existing state of prosperity. We are destroying our farmland and have grown dangerously dependent upon external sources for oil, metals, and other non-renewable resources. Nations such as Japan, Holland, and Haiti are even more seriously overpopulated and therefore in greater jeopardy. Reproduction is no longer exclusively a personal matter. Society must have a voice and some power of direction in regulating this vital function. The desires of human couples are very important, but they must not neglect the consideration of society at large. The general welfare of this and future generations must be given increasing consideration as we develop plans for rational guidance of our procreation. We cannot foretell the exact climax limit for human numbers. Providing even 500 million people with current American living standards may exceed that limit on a perpetual time scale. From this, he concludes that every government needs to have a considered population policy, but he's not envisioning a world government imposing it. He wants each nation to make the determination for itself how many people it should have. Each nation must consider the present and future availability of all resources required for its long-continuing survival. With proper allowance for the interchange of commodities that are overabundant in some areas and scarce in others, rational estimates must be made of the optimum population which can be sustained by those resources on a perpetual timescale. Each nation must make this determination for its own people. So he's not calling for a mass extermination by a totalitarian global state, but a series of free decisions made by different countries. Now, concerning the methods employed to achieve this goal slowly over generations, he says, Irresponsible childbearing must be discouraged by legal and social pressures. Couple who cannot provide a decent home and support for a child should not produce children to be a burden for their neighbors. Society can provide practical incentives and disincentives to guide individuals in their childbearing so as to protect the legitimate long-term welfare of the larger social group. This must be done even though at times the wishes of individuals must be made subordinate to the needs of the state. Reasonable compromises can achieve a balance between the individual's rights and those of other citizens. Here, he envisions using social pressures, which presumably would be stigmatizing parents who have large families. He also mentions legal pressures, though it's not clear what those would be. They could be anything from having a child tax, so that you need to pay a fee for each child you have, to forced sterilizations or abortions, like in China. However, he speaks of reasonable compromises and practical incentives and disincentives, which at least sound more like the former than the use of force. He also says this, Knowledge and techniques for regulating human reproduction are now in existence. Moral and political leaders throughout the world have a grave responsibility to make this knowledge and these techniques generally available. While it's hypothetically possible, he could be referring to governments providing education and resources for natural family planning. I don't think he's limiting himself to that. I think that this is a reference at a minimum to the use of contraception. 
Now we come to abortion. Much controversy now rages over the acceptability of abortion as a last resort for eliminating unwanted pregnancies. Heat engendered by these discussions may subside somewhat as we better understand the nature of life and discuss further the philosophical question of ensoulment or the acquisition of human nature by a fertilized ovum. We know that the human zygote perpetuates a flame of life which began on Earth more than two billion years ago. Some dedicated and sincere opponents of abortion believe it is murder to destroy a, an early human embryo, even at the single-cell stage of development. In light of conventional wisdom and traditional morality, abortion must be considered an evil, but there can be even greater evils. Sometimes we must choose the least evil with an array of evils. Certain abortions may be lesser evils than available alternatives and thus be morally defensible. Hopefully, the development of absolutely effective methods for avoiding unwanted pregnancies will make these questions irrelevant. In these delicate areas of moral judgment, humanity must rely on the collective conscience of our race. No single individual or group should impose its position on others until a consensus has been developed from the best informed and most compassionate spokesmen from all groups. So he's got a more nuanced view of abortion than you might expect. He doesn't rule out that abortion may be murder. He does recognize abortion as evil. He thinks it may be a necessary evil to avoid greater ones like overpopulation, but he hopes that other effective means of avoiding unwanted pregnancies will eliminate this. And he says that this is a delicate area of moral judgment and no one group should impose its views until some kind of magical consensus is reached. That all adds up to the kind of soft pro-abortion stance that was pioneered in the 1970s rather than the hardcore stance of pro-abortion activists. That is, he recognizes that abortion is an evil, which he thinks may be needed, but let's try to avoid it through other means, as opposed to the idea abortion is a positive good and a fundamental right. So he's wrong, but not as wrong as he could be. He's on the thoughtful side of wrong. You said that you don't think Kirsten is right that the Earth's long-term carrying capacity is half a billion. Why not? Because he's neglecting several factors. First, he was forming his ideas in the 1960s and 1970s when overpopulation was a big scare and there were looming predictions that environmental disaster and worldwide famine were just around the corner, like in Paul and Ann Ehrlich's 1968 book, The Population Bomb. People have been making predictions like that ever since Thomas Malthus's 1798 book, An Essay on the Principle of Population, and they've repeatedly and consistently been wrong. So I understand why Kirsten had this idea, but it's mistaken. One of the reasons is that new people don't just bring new mouths into the world. They also bring new brains and new hands, which let them build new technologies and find new resources, leading to a rising standard of living alongside a rising population. Another reason is the areas of the world that currently have famine and ecological disasters don't have them because of their populations. They have them because their societies are broken. Singapore has one of the highest population densities in the world, but it also has one of the richest per capita economies. If the poorest countries on Earth ran themselves like Singapore, they wouldn't be poor anymore. A third reason Kirsten is wrong is that we aren't limited to the resources we have on Earth. Uh, sure, the surface of the Earth has some maximum number of people it can hold, probably 10 times or more what it currently does, but we don't have to get resources from just here on Earth. We can mine the entire solar system for resources. And if we ever hit the surface maximum number of inhabitants, we can just move some people off world and colonize other places in the solar system. Are we ever likely to hit the population level on Earth where moving off world is necessary? I don't think so, because as economies develop, the birth rate goes down since parents don't need as many kids and kids switch from being an economic asset to being an economic liability. Consequently, the world population is not expected to skyrocket, but to level off and start declining later in the 21st century. 
that may happen, especially as robots start doing more work in society, allowing an improved standard of living with fewer people. And who knows how far the depopulation trend will go. We may end up with a world with dramatically fewer people than we now have, with people living a science fiction lifestyle and without any deliberate population control efforts. The further development of economies and technology may lead to that naturally. As a result, I don't think that the half a billion limit Kirsten proposes is even close to right. With more developed economies and technology and with off-world resources, Earth can hold vastly more people than it does now, only it won't, because the population will come down on its own. And so the, oh no, we've got to aggressively limit population or disaster will result ideas that Kirsten had in the 1970s are so 1970s. (laughs) So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on Kirsten and the Guidestones? I think Kirsten was a sincere man who wanted to do something to help future generations of mankind, which is why he built the Guidestones. That was especially understandable given the Cold War tensions and the likelihood of nuclear war. And the Guidestones are an interesting way to address that problem. They aren't intrinsically sinister. They're not a cult, and they don't represent a totalitarian New World Order. The ten pieces of advice written on them aren't ten commandments of the Antichrist. They're ideas Kirsten and his associates had that seemed good to them, but Kirsten recognized they weren't infallible. He acknowledged that they needed to be debated, and he hoped that some of them would prove useful. Many of the things written on the Guidestones are basically platitudes that are hard to object to, like pass just laws and don't have useless bureaucrats. Others are more problematic, something that applies even more clearly to some of the ideas in his book, and some of them are flat out wrong. So I think that Kirsten and the Guidestones are well-meaning, but imperfect. Jimmy, what further resources would the listener want to have to look up more about this subject? We'll have a link to the book, The Georgia Guidestones, America's Most Mysterious Monument. Also, the documentary, Dark Clouds Over Elberton, the true story of the Georgia Guidestones. So you can see the case that the filmmakers make. Also, Robert Christian's book, Common Sense Renewed, which you can read online. An article on literacy tests and another on poll taxes and another on the grand Grandfather Clause, an article on eugenics, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Face Instruction Dignitas Personae, an article on Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, and another article on Thomas Malthus and his population theories. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this time? Well, we have an update of sorts on episode 83, The Missing Universe, in which we talked about dark energy and dark matter. We have two articles on new studies, one of which supports modified gravity. So there's a new study that supports modifying the our understanding of how gravity works, and that could account for some or all of the readings that otherwise are interpreted as supporting dark matter. Also, one wondering, could dark matter be antimatter. And so you'll want to check that out as well. Excellent. So that's it from us. What are your theories about the Georgia Guidestones and the supposed Ten Commandments of the Antichrist and what Herbert Kirsten had to say in his book? We'd love to hear from you, and you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page. Send us an email at mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. If you can, we would really appreciate when you do so. Share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from. That helps us grow our community of listeners and reach more people. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious and remember to help us continue to produce the podcast please visit sqpn.com slash give until next time jimmy aiken thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world thanks dom and once again i'm dom bethanelli thank you for listening to jimmy aiken's mysterious world on starquest <laughs>